Okay, good. All right, guys. So today we're going to continue talking about uh, plasticity. And so far, we have been talking about stress insensitive failure criteria. So those are failure criteria in which the maximum stress is, it just depends on deviatoric stress, but it doesn't depend on mean stress. So when, when we say stress insensitive, it really we mean that uh, they are insensitive to the mean stress. And when we talk about porous materials, we refer to the mean effective stress. So um, we're going to, to do one more thing with this von Mises criterion. Uh, we're going to plot this von Mises criterion in such a way that we're going to look as if we were here looking exactly through the hydrostatic axis. So the hydrostatic axis, which is a line, is going to look like a point. And if we do that, uh, then what we, we're going to get, it is a something that looks more or less like this. These are the three axes of the principal stresses. And now, uh, if we were to draw this for for Tresca criterion, it will look like the hexagon that we have been drawing before. Notice that those are the sides of a cube. If you were to look at this cube, hydrostatic axis is that point over there. And if we draw the the von Mises criterion, it's going to be a circle that circumscribes this hexagon. So again, the hexagon is going to be Tresca. The circle is going to be von Bon misses. And the radio of, the radius of that circle, uh, as we saw over here, is going to be square root of two thirds times sigma y. Remember that that you're looking here, this is a three-dimensional plot, right? So this is 3D space, this is the hydrostatic axis, and we're looking just at the deviatoric plane. The radius in the deviatoric plane is square root of two-thirds times sigma y, and sigma y in three dimensions goes from the center of this coordinate system to that point. Uh, but on the deviatoric plane, it is this amount. So for uh, the Tresk and the, and the von Mises criterion, all you care about is about this circle. As long as your state of stress doesn't get out of this circle, that hexagon in this deviatoric plane, uh, you're fine. There is, there is no yield. However, we know that uh, this is not uh, true for, for rocks and uh, we know that the rocks are um, stress sensitive. Or if we are a little bit more precise, we should say uh, effective stress, effective mean stress, sensitive. And in, in order to, to investigate or to, to plot what these failure criteria are going to be, we're going to have to add one dependence on the value of the mean stress, or which is equivalent on the value of the first invariant. So let's draw here, now in three dimensions, the 
space of principal stresses and if we have a hydrostatic axis that goes like this uh, and stress sensitive criterion is a criterion in which the value of J2 is going to vary as we move along this uh, surface. So probably here we can have, same as before, a circle, but the radius of that circle is going to vary as we vary the mean stress. And the failure surface of such failure criterion is going to look like a cone, where the radius of the cone depends on where you are along this hydrostatic axis. There is going to be a limit, according to this cone, that you cannot go beyond that because you will have tensile failure. So there, there is this, in, the, in the previous case, you could go infinitely uh, in that direction. That was fine. But now you, you cannot go in this direction because there is an end for that. You could go infinitely in that direction, but you cannot go infinitely in the other direction. Um, and if we wanted to fit here a, a modified Tresca criterion that is stress sensitive, again, uh, we're going to have an hexagon which is inscribed in that, uh, in that cone. And the equation for this is going to be uh, very simple. It's just going to say that the maximum minus the least principal stress uh, is going to be a given value, let's say, C1, but now we're going to tell this uh, value to increase according to a constant C2 and multiply times a, let's just simplify it by sigma n, by the mean stress. So now I, I have added this term that is adding this dependence. So the the possible maximum value difference between principal stresses, now it depends on the mean stress. And we call that uh, to be stress sensitive. Uh, this will be the Tresca criterion, right? And you still have the problems of these sharp edges that if we want to take derivatives, as we hopefully will do today if we get to that part, uh, uh, you are not going to be able to do it. So remember that this side, we're assuming is more compression. So more compression uh, makes the rocks stronger. So similar to this uh, failure criterion, which is called modified Tresca, uh, we're going to find uh, the Drager Prager criterion in which in, instead of talking about difference, differences of principal stresses, we directly talk about J2. So we're going to say the square root of J2 is going to be a value, a constant, plus another constant times the first invariant of the stress tensor. And it's exactly the same as before, but now it's defined with a deviatoric stress rather than uh, with the difference between principal stresses. And this one is going to give you this smooth shape. It's going to give you the conical shape. The other one is going to give you that uh, hexagonal pyramid with, uh, with the vertex in this point. Uh, it's, you know, it may look like a lot of work to, to plot that failure criterion with a three-dimensional surface. Uh, instead of that, we could go much easier, at least for the Drucker Prager, and just make a two dimensional plot in which this is I1, this is square of, or J2, and we see that this is just a line because these are all constants. So this is going to be just a line. As long as you don't go above this line or to the left of that point, uh, you're not going to get into the yield. Yes, Robert. Are C1 and C3 related to yield stress? Yes, yes. And uh, actually, 
uh, let's see. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to, to show the values of C3 and C4 later on. But I think for now, we just can keep it as, uh, as constants. Actually, in the, in the homework, you have to determine those two values based on triaxial tests. All right, so let's see now what is the origin of this stress sensitivity. Why rocks are stress sensitive and why uh, we need to use this type of uh, failure criteria. So we're going to call this stress sensitive. In particular, particularly, this is going to apply for geomaterials. You have seen this drawing probably a hundred times. But you're going to see that this is exactly the same as we need in order to, to find out the stress sensitivity for uh, geomaterials. The force that you need in this element, which is lying on the surface, the force that you need in order to make it move is going to be proportional to the normal stress on it, right? And what is going to be the proportionality coefficient for that? Where mu is what? Where mu is the friction coefficient, right? So the, the bigger the normal stress that I put on, on, a, um, on, a, on a solid on a surface, right? If, if I put this one in here and, and I let it drop, it's going to drop. But as soon as I put some normal stress, it's not going to drop anymore, and even I can put the weight of my pencil, and if it's stable, it's not going to fall, right? Or I can put many more things here on top. As, as long as I put stress, it's not going to fall. And with materials, geomaterials, especially granular materials, we, we're going to make the transition later to cemented material, uh, is exactly the same. So. Let's imagine a granular material which is composed by grains and which is subjective to an effective stress on, on the sides. Let's assume this is cylindrical. And here I have a, a bigger uh, effective stress on this side. If you want to make this material deform, and fail, you will have to, at the micro scale, to overcome also friction forces, right? All these grains, they also have a normal stress. And in order to make this grain to move down, let's say that you're applying stress in this direction. So you want this grain to move down and this one to move up you also need to overcome that frictional strength. Sometimes in these type of surfaces and also with fractures or with uh, contacts, you have a uh, frictional or tangential stiffness that will give you still allow you to have a, an elastic strain. But in order to make these grains slide the same as this, you need to overcome that frictional stress. And the bigger the normal stress, the bigger the shear stress that you have to put in order to uh, fail uh, that kind of material. And because of that, similar to this, uh, if we make a, a more circle, we know that this shear failure line, if we have no stress at all, we don't need any stress to mobilize those surfaces, but if we do have a normal stress, the maximum principal stress that you can put on a on a material on a frictional material like this one, sigma one depends on sigma three. 
the bigger the confining stress, the bigger the stress that you need in order to fail uh, the material. And the equation for this one is the same as, as this one over here. And uh, now probably you may be tempted to uh, calculate if I gave you this equation, what is the relationship between sigma 1 and sigma 3? How would you do that? Let me tell you something else. This is going to be the friction angle, where the tangent of the friction angle is mu. So it's not too complicated. What you would do is you get to the center of the Mohr circle, This shear point is going to be located at, if you look, if you do a little bit of geometry, you will see that also this angle is the friction angle phi. This is the radius of the circle. This is the center of the circle, right? And if I write again uh, this equation, tau equal to mu sigma n, what is going to be tau based on these two numbers? Can you tell me that? I'm based on trigonometry. What is the radius of the circle? Divided by two, right? And if I want to get this amount, you will do cosine friction angle, right? And this is going to be equal to uh, the mu, which is the tangent of, of the friction angle, times what is sigma n? Sigma n is a little bit more difficult. minus the sine of phi, of phi sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 2, right? So uh, you can work and do a little bit of math based on that equation, and, uh, and you will find that uh, sigma 1, exactly the same equation as that one, but now in terms of principal stresses, is going to be that sigma 1 is 1 plus the sine of phi divided 1 minus sine of phi times sigma 3. So it's a very simple equation. Let's say that, uh, in, in order to put some numbers into this, let's say that friction angle is 30 degrees. What is going to be mu? Can you guys do that with the, your calculators? I, I don't have that with me right now. What, what is mu? So mu is the tangent of 30. 0.5772. Uh, so let's say 0.58, okay? And this amount over here, we're going to call it, uh, I'm going to try to avoid using this notation because we're using Q for our PQ diagrams, right? Uh, but uh, you, you may find it in, in my notes uh, when, where I don't talk a lot about PQ diagrams that we use this Q as a stress and isotropy ratio. And that value uh, is going to be uh, equal to what if phi is equal to 30? I know you can do this without a calculator. 3, right? It's going to be 3. And I like that you remember that number because that, that is a very important number. It tells you that the maximum stress and isotropy in a given geomaterial with a friction angle equal to 30 is 3. On fluids, you cannot, you cannot have any stress uh, anisotropy. 
uh, because uh, fluids cannot bear stress and isotropy, but solids can. And even uncemented solids that have a frictional strength, they can bear a, a strength, and that strength, stress and isotropy is equal to 3. This same equation tells you as well, as we, we knew before, but, but now it's a little bit more explicit, that if you don't have any confining effective stress, any uh, minimum principal effective stress, you cannot bear any uh, stress at all in any other direction. So if you don't have confining, you are not able to put the stress in the other direction. But if you do, that amount is proportional to the confining that you put, the effective stress that you put on it through this coefficient, uh, which is equal to 3. All right? And uh, I have an example to, to show that this is right. Yes, uh, Michael. Say, there should be another B on the bottom. Of the yes, B thank you. Thank you, thank you. I was, that, that looked a little bit weird to me. I didn't know why. So, yeah, that's an RP. All right, okay. So, I know that some of you are very familiar with triaxial tests, but some others, they, they are not, okay? So I have an example here of a, of a granular material, <laughs> which is uh, confined. And look, it looks, uh, looks like a brick. I'm, I'm sure you don't want me to throw this at you because it's, it's very strong, okay? It's very strong, and even if uh, I, I, I could put all, all my weight on it, and it, 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 will, it will resist my weight. Do you guys know what this is? <laughs> what? It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's in Portuguese. So any... Okay, we're going to leave it. I, I'm just going to tell you by now that this is a it, this is a material, okay? It's a material. It's a porous. <laughs> it's a porous material, and uh, it it now it is strong and also stiff uh, because there is effective stress on it. Uh, when they put this food product in this bag, they apply a vacuum to it. Uh, so the pore pressure inside is negative one atmosphere or so because we have all the air that now is applying a, uh, a, a pressure on this membrane. So if I were to make a, a, a zoom into, into this, inside we have grains. And here we have atmospheric pressure. And that atmospheric pressure, which it's applied on this direction, but also on this one, and on this one, on that one, and this one, and that one, it makes all of these particles to have a effective mean of stress also of one atmosphere. Right? So, I don't know how stable is this, but uh, let, let me see also what can be seen over there in the camera. I, I think you, you can see this. Uh, le, 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 let me zoom in. So, I'm going to try to stand, put all my weight on this coffee to see that, uh, to make a, a proof that that uncemented cohesionless materials can bear an effective stress. Okay? And I, I'm going to risk my life as I do that. With, paper. With what? Oh, uh, yeah, probably, but I, I like this one better. Okay, so, so look. <laughs> what? Exactly, low. yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> so, well, but I'm, I'm not going to be able to, to record it with a camera unless, unless I have a cameraman 
there in the back to help me do that. But I, I, th I think this looks a little bit more risky than <laughs> just standing on. on. All right, so, so raise your hand if you think that this, that this material is going to support my weight, if you think so or not. I see, I see five people, four people that think that. So, so probably I see that half of you think that this is not going to support my weight, right? Okay, so here I go. It deformed a little bit, okay? But, but still, still solid, still strong. Let me try to do it again. You see, and, and still, still strong. So I'm going to open now this, this package so, so, so you get to see what, what it is. Uh, and you, you'll be surprised about what you see. I hope so. So I, I, I think I should send an email to the guys of, that make this coffee to, for the free advertisement that I'm doing. Uh, so, so okay. So, so this coffee, right? So this coffee, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to get my mic. Probably, probably you won't hear this right now. But if you check the video, you'll hear it. I told you this under under vacuum, right? So, if if I now break this membrane. Let's try not to make any noise, okay? Wait, I didn't hear anything. You didn't hear anything, right? But I, I did, I did because I'm very close. Probably, you know, if you look at the video, you'll see, but it already made, made a noise. All right, so. Inside. Inside we have ground coffee, and and it, it is cohesionless. It's uncemented. It, it's just these are just grains of coffee, right? That they were we were able to. I was able to more or less stand on it just because of frictional strength of the coffee against the other. Uh, grains of coffee. And I could repeat now, let me open this a little bit further. So now that I have opened the bag, do you think that I can put all my weight onto this coffee? I mean, unless you want to make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, pro probably not, right? So look, I I'm, I'm not even, I'm just going to put the weight of my hand here and I'm going to make a mess anyways. But you'll see that now, like, this, this is not resisting any way that, uh, anymore, right? It's <laughs> actually, actually, I drink this coffee. It's very good coffee. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 going, I'm going to get a Ziploc bag later to, to take this coffee and take it home uh, for, my, for my breakfast. Uh, all right, so it is going to be the same thing with uncemented sediments, with sand, with seals, with clay, with anything. As long as you have a effective stress on it, they are going to be strong. And actually, they, they can be super strong, right? If you, the, here, you know, I just put one atmosphere. One atmosphere is nothing. One atmosphere is... 0.1 MPA, uh, 0.1 MPA is uh, is nothing compared to the effective stresses that you can have in the subsurface that go to 10 MPA or more easily. So they can get very very strong. And for example, in World War stability, uh, if as you have to solve it in your project, but you have a cemented uh, rock in that case. If you don't have any effective stress, any wall support, effective stress support on the wall, and you're drilling through an uncemented sand, you, you cannot do that. You need a drilling mud. If you don't, if you don't have drilling mud, 
if you don't have support against the wall of a wellboard in, in uncemented sand, it's just going to, to break, it's going to collapse. So in order to, to be able to drill through uncemented sand, then you need that effective stress. If, but if you do, then your material can be quite strong. Uh, okay, so let me see, where, where am I? Yes. Yeah. So, in this case, when I put my weight on it, I had a sigma 3 of one atmosphere. When I put my weight, I increase the stress in one direction. So, sigma m, it gets a little bit bigger than that. So, it's going to be, yeah. But the sigma 3, the, sig the important thing is the sigma 3, uh, at least with the simple Mark Coulomb criterion, we're going to see that that if you want to get a little bit more uh, rigorous, it depends on the mean stress, the mean effective stress. Uh, all right, so uh, what, what I had before was for granular materials, uncemented granular materials, we see that we have this, uh, this law where the shear stress proportional to normal effective stress. And we say that that one is equivalent to say that that sigma 1 at failure is equal to 1 plus sine of phi, 1 minus sine of phi, where this is phi, um, times sigma 3. And this will be an uncemented granular material. We also have porous materials which are cemented. Uh, and for, for those, uh, they still are made out of grains. They're still stress sensitive. And they're going to have a very similar law to this one, but it's going to be shifted. And now the shear stress, in this case, is going to be, uh, is going to have an intercept that we're going to call it cohesive strength. And the frictional uh, part is going to re remain the same. So in this case, this one is S0. And similar to that plot, I can also for these frictional materials, sometimes it's easier to do this, uh, that you plot what is the maximum sigma 1 as a function of sigma 3. And in that case, if I have an uncemented material, it will go through the origin. And 